This is Duke University. From Jefferson Public Radio at Southern Oregon University, this is the Jefferson Exchange. I'm Jeffrey Riley. Coming up after the news, climate change and its effect on the economy in our country's biggest state, biggest in population and economy, that is. A new study says climate change will affect California ecosystems, which will in turn affect the economy and not in a good way. The study looks at two areas, natural livestock forage and carbon sequestration in forests. Linwood Pendleton at Duke University and Rebecca Shaw at the Environmental Defense Fund will join us to discuss the findings. We'll get into the assumptions the study makes, since this is a future tense scenario. And we'll ask about how far into the future the timeline goes. The study is published now in a scientific journal on climate change. Rebecca Shaw, Linwood Pendleton, climate change, ecosystems, and the economy. And your phone calls and emails ahead on the Jefferson Exchange. First, this hour's news. Six on the Jefferson Exchange on the News and Information Service of Jefferson Public Radio. I'm Jeffrey Riley. I'm glad you're along for the ride today. It is Tuesday, February 7th, 2012, and a reminder that you can listen to the Jefferson Exchange where you are right now, which is either on a radio station serving Oregon and California or streaming online at ijpr.org. In this hour, climate and ecosystem and economy and a report that indicates what might happen in California if the first item in the list, climate, continues to change. We'll hear from the authors of a report on potential climate change impacts on the economy. Call us to discuss. You're always welcome to join us at 800-838-3760, toll free around the region. Our Rogue Valley local number, 541-552-6782. And we do take emails during the live broadcast as well. Those go to jx at jeffnet.org. First, a weather forecast. Here's Samantha Grafton. On the northern California and Mendocino coast, rain likely today, cloudy and windy with a high near 59. A slight chance of showers tonight, mostly cloudy with a low around 45. For Redding and Red Bluff, rain likely today, cloudy with a high near 52. A chance of showers tonight, mostly cloudy, becoming mostly clear with a low around 41. For Wairika, a slight chance of rain, high winds possible, cloudy with a high near 52 today. A slight chance of rain tonight, mostly cloudy with a low around 33. For Reed and Mount Shasta, rain and wind likely, cloudy with a high near 44. A chance of rain tonight, mostly cloudy with a low around 29. On the southern Oregon coast, a slight chance of rain today, cloudy with a high near 57. A slight chance of rain tonight, mostly cloudy with a low around 44. In the Klamath Basin, a slight chance of rain today, mostly cloudy with a high near 49. A slight chance of rain tonight, mostly cloudy and a low around 27. For Grants Pass, Medford, and Ashland, a slight chance of rain today, some gusty winds in the morning, clouds with a high near 58. A slight chance of rain, mostly cloudy tonight with a low around 38. In the Southern Oregon Cascades and Siskiyous, a chance of rain and snow late afternoon today, mostly cloudy with a high near 39. A chance of rain and snow tonight, mostly cloudy with a low around 25. For Roseburg and the Umpqua Basin, a slight chance of rain today, mostly cloudy with a high near 55. A slight chance of rain tonight, mostly cloudy and a low around 39. And for Eugene and Springfield, a slight chance of rain this afternoon, mostly cloudy with a high near 52. A slight chance of rain tonight, mostly cloudy with a low around 42. So there actually is some uh, shower activity happening around the region for the first time in a couple of days anyway. We did have a fairly dry and almost spring-like uh, weekend on a Monday, but it looks like things are reverting back to a bit of a more normal position. And it looks like Douglas County is getting the most of it right now. There's a line of showers that is um, right over Roseburg and running to the east and southeast of there. So some activity north of Medford as well and in the Cascades. A whole bunch going on, it looks like, in Humboldt and Del Norte counties right now. Perhaps some rain in Redding as well. I did feel some drops myself in Ashland this morning. So a bit of activity out there. Not much of an issue for the roads, certainly, because uh, it's still pretty warm out there. Siskiyou Summit, you can barely find any snow at all up there right now. So... Not the kind of conditions in which you would need to have chains uh, in use anyway, but but have them available. And, uh, yeah, so the system is kind of pushing up into our region from the southwest. And um, so if you're not getting a little damp now, you probably will sometime over the course of the day. 
which those of us who are keeping an eye on the water totals can rejoice about because, of course, if it stays a whole lot drier than it has been, we're going to be in some hurting territory later in the year. But uh, So keep the, keep the showers coming, folks. And for the folks in the Ashland area concerned about the smoke, there have been controlled burns up in the Ashland watershed as part of the restoration project up there. And we're told that is the source of the smoke. When the wind kicked up yesterday, it fanned the flames just a bit and bent the snow, the smoke down toward the ground where it was being observed and smelled by a lot more people. But uh, at this point, we're told there's no particular problem with it. Thanks for joining us on the Jefferson Exchange today. Very much appreciate your presence. And you can join us in person as well and take part in our conversations. Our phone number is 800-838-3760, toll free anywhere in the region. In the Rogue Valley, our local number, 541-552-6782, and our email address, jx at jeffnet.org. Much of the skepticism about climate change references what is perceived to be the incredible cost in dollars and human disruptions that could result from profound changes in how we manage our energy and economy. But a recent report says there will be costs incurred anyway, costs created by climate change itself. The report in question is called The Impact of Climate Change on California Ecosystem Services. And we have two of its authors with us here on the exchange today. And Rebecca Shaw is the lead report author. She's with the Environmental Defense Fund as vice president of Land, Water, and Wildlife. Also a working group member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, which you probably have heard about a time or two. Rebecca Shaw, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me today, Jeffrey. I really appreciate being on. Glad to have you, and uh, glad to have Linwood Pendleton as well, who is co-author of the study and director of Ocean and Coastal Policy at Duke University's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy and the acting, acting chief economist for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. Welcome, Linwood. Welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, how do you find time to sleep if you're, <laughs> if you're doing all of this at the same time? I work on the plane a lot. Ah, that makes sense. Tell us a bit about uh, about what goes on at the Duke University Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy and, and what you do for it. Well, the, the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy is uh, an institute that was created by our provost to straddle the world of academia and the world of policymaking. So I, in my previous life, was a tenured professor at UCLA, where, of course, I was spending a lot of time writing papers and teaching. And I moved to this institute so I could... Uh, respond more quickly to the needs of policymakers and, and bring them the best available science to address uh, questions that they had and needed to have answered fairly quickly. Um, so are these uh, political policymakers or policymakers at departmental levels within government, or, or where are they? Where or, are you generally or, or both. Or, or, both. I, I, or they could be at the United Nations. Uh, they could be um, prime ministers in the Pacific Islands. They could be at the governor's office. And the report that uh, Rebecca and I will be talking about really was done in part to support the state of California's efforts to understand how climate could affect the state of California generally. Well, there's your cue, Rebecca. Tell us a bit about yourself and the Environmental Defense Fund and the IPCC for that matter as well. Uh, well I, I am a climate change scientist by uh, training, and I run the Land, Water, Wildlife Program at the Environmental Defense Fund. The Environmental Defense Fund is dedicated to finding market-based solutions to today's environmental challenges that benefit, that will end up benefiting both people and nature. Um, so in that context, it's that context that we uh, do studies like this to better understand exactly what the impacts of climate change will be on uh, nature and what the economic impacts will be and what the market solutions may be to help us address those impacts. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a, a body of uh, scientists from around the world that comes together every five years and um, synthesizes all the published, available published science on climate change and uh, synthesizes it into a format that uh, policymakers and other interested parties can understand and can make use of. So the next report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change will be out in 2014. When we talk about market-based solutions to some of the issues raised by, by climate change, then are we talking about creating a situation in which there's somebody selling, somebody buying, a transaction, a financial transaction of some sort taking place? That's right. That's right. And, and I think in the context of the, the study at hand today, um, we really are looking at uh, uh, understanding that um, climate change impacts nature. Uh, nature 
currently provides benefits uh, to us, uh, to Californians and to other uh, others, and including water supply, um, grazing land, carbon storage, protection from flood, and even timber. There's, so some of these things are, some of these benefits are benefits that we readily recognize, and others are uh, benefits that aren't as um, aren't as noticeable on a daily basis. So the the point of this study is to look at the impacts of climate change on um, nature, better understand uh, the benefits we receive from nature, and understand what the impacts will be. Um, on our economy based on the impacts on nature. And the, one of the, two, two of the, uh, those benefits that we highlight in this study are um, uh, forage production for cattle grazing. The second is carbon storage for, um, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reducing climate change. So essentially, uh, forage for grazing animals and, uh, and and forest. I mean, we're talking about that's where most of the carbon sequestration takes place, isn't it? That's right. That's right. And 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 there are there once we realize and we take into account that these that forests and uh, and grazing lands actually have a very um, a calculable economic benefit to our society. We can begin then to understand better how we use those benefits and develop strategies to market-based strategies to make sure that we're enhancing our management of both forests and grazing lands to get the benefits we want or to retain the benefits we want long-term. Linwood Pendleton, you said something um, a few moments ago about uh, about the genesis of the study or suggested that this was, uh, the, you know, you talked about the work you do with uh, providing information for policymakers. So was there a particular request that led to this study beginning? Well, there was a whole series of um, request for proposals to uh, look at different aspects of the way climate change could impact California. And there are papers in the journal, there was a special edition of the Journal of Climatic Change that really captured these studies that were done for climate in California that looked at agriculture and freshwater. And what we tried to do is provide an illustration for um, these impacts on nature. And so the, the two areas where we focused were really places where we thought we could develop this illustration very carefully. And so, you know, my interest in participating um, in the study was because I, I felt that when people were thinking about climate change and how that might affect the world around them, we tended to have caricatures of what those effects might be from oh, it's not going to mean anything but nicer, warmer beach days to, okay, well, let's think about this. Maybe if I live down at sea level, it could mean some sea level rise. Or it could be like you were talking about in the weather forecast. Um, you know, when, when it doesn't snow, we go, oh, it's climate change. And then when it snows again, we think, oh, thank goodness, <laughs> it's back. <laughs> and what we really know um, is that, yeah, it, you know, it starts with snow. It starts with temperature. Um, but then it really gets into fires, and you mentioned the fires that were going on today. And things like snowfall and fires, when they happen uh, repeatedly over time and we really start changing these patterns, it changes the world around us, the living world around us. And so I don't think most people have really um, developed a very good understanding of how the living world around them is likely to change because of climate. And then what does that mean for our, our well-being? Um, particularly our economic well-being. So uh, this was an opportunity to look at two things, carbon sequestration and forests and forage, where we, we felt we had enough information and enough modeling know-how to really um, track this from predicted scenarios of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere to changes in the climate, to changes in land cover, to changes in the way that this could affect people. Uh, this really is just scratching the surface of right. where we should go with this. All right. Yeah, we have, we have definitely scratched the surface. Now we get to go a little deeper in the uh, next segment. But we'll take a break right now here on the Jefferson Exchange. We'll come back and talk more with Linwood Pendleton and M. Rebecca Shaw about the impact of climate change on California ecosystem services. Back with Rebecca and Linwood and your phone calls and emails after a break. Back in a minute.
This is the Jefferson Exchange on Jefferson Public Radio. I'm Jeffrey Riley. Thanks for listening. Our guests today, Am Rebecca Shaw and Linwood Pendleton, were talking about the study they co-authored, The Impact of Climate Change on California Ecosystem Services, indicating that as the climate changes, there will be impacts on ecosystems within California and resulting impacts on California's economy. You can join our discussion on the exchange, 800-838-3760, toll-free anywhere in the region. In the Rogue Valley, 541-552-6782. And our email address, jx at jeffnet.org. Rebecca Shaw, again, the lead report author, author from the Environmental Defense Fund and also a working group member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. Rebecca, obviously you're making some assumptions going into this report, so you're, first of all, assuming climate change is real. And is that is that impossible to dispute any longer, regardless of how you feel about what causes it? Well, I, I think, and you know, as a scientist, um, we abide by the scientific method for understanding and um, the world around us and adopting, uh, developing ideas about whether theory is actually a fact. I, I think at this point, and at this point, there is um, overwhelming evidence that that climate change is happening and it is caused by. Um, by human activities. So uh, what I think the, the places where we really focus on in the report to better understand how we might be able to uh, manage this in the future is what the different levels of climate change might be in the future and what their impact might be, whether there'll be more, more rain or more snow, whether it'll be hotter and drier or warmer and wetter, because it's, it's those conditions, those changing conditions that are impacted by climate and weather that really have an impact on, on um, nature and the world around us and that will change the forests and change the rangelands that we depend on. All right, so let's, let's drill a little deeper. Linwood Pendleton is the Director of Ocean and Coastal Policy at Duke University's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy and the Acting Chief Economist for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Linwood, when we talk about ecosystem services, what are those? Because that's obviously one of the, it's the major portion of this uh, that we uh, have, have yet to, uh, to really get into. It, they're the goods and services that nature provides, some of which are traded in the market, like fish um, that you catch, uh, some of them have markets that have developed around them, like uh, hiking and um, outdoor recreation. And some of these are things like provisioning services that it's the ability of nature to help protect us from a storm surge if you're on the coast or from landslides if you're on the mountain where we're really thinking about you know, wooded trees. So it's, it's the whole array of the ways that uh, the environment affects uh, the economy and particularly the well-being of people. All right, so goods and services then that you get. And, you know, in some cases as, as with the fish, it's a good, and with uh, protection from, from floods and things like that, it's a service. That's yeah. right. And so forage is a good, for instance. You don't have to pay for forage necessarily, uh, but it's something that the cows eat. And if they didn't eat it, you'd have to replace that forage with something else. All right. So when we talk about forage, then we're talking about uh, forage that comes from, let me see if I got the, the terminology right. So it's non-irrigated forage, but essentially forage that grows naturally? That's right, grassland. Got it. Okay. And and how big an area is this in, in California, Rebecca Shaw? Um, ooh, that's, that is absolutely a, a question I should know the answer to, um, but don't have it off the top of my head. But it's it's quite um, it, it's quite large within California, and um, in California, the Federal Agriculture Department reported that there are about 5.2 million head of cattle in California, less than 10% raised on, in feedlots. So um, there's a lot of grasslands out there, a lot of grazing lands that a lot of our cattle industry depends upon. All right, so that, that's a good number to work with, though. 5.2 million cattle in the state and less than 10% of those are fed on feedlots? Yeah. Okay, so a lot of people then, are, or a lot of uh, people who are raising cattle are depending on these uh, these forage lands. And so what, what were some of the effects that you were able to uh, to indicate? And first of all, let, let's talk about some of the models you used here. Were you t using computer models to figure out if the climate changes in this way, this will happen? That's right, and, and, and we, we don't know exactly how climate will change in the future, I, I think that that's part of the part of the science that is uh, still developing. We know that um, that it's likely to become hotter and drier, but 
we use computer models to better to, to tell us how climate will change uh, under different levels of greenhouse gas emissions or CO2, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then we ask the question, how, how will um, those changes in climate affect the way our, the forests, the grazing lands or the grasslands, and the shrublands? Um, and then we ask the question, how will this impact the economies that are dependent on those, on the forest lands, the grazing lands, and the shrublands? Um, so the computer models are the basis. The climate models are the basis of understanding the changes and the impacts. And we also use models to better understand how, the, how uh, nature or forest grazing lands and shrublands will respond to those climate changes. And why, Rebecca, choose these two categories, the carbon sequestration and the, uh, and the forage lands, the forage production? Um, uh, our initial study uh, was a much broader study, but when, for this particular report, we uh, focused on the two um, ecosystem services or, the, or, or nature's benefits that, that we get, that, that where we could really clearly um, isolate the impact of climate on the on nature and on the type of ecosystem that um, produces the service, we could understand that how the change in that that those ecosystems would change the service, and when we could actually do a market valuation of what the impact would be on California's economy. There's that's a lot of pieces of information, linking information to better understand how climate change might affect us in the future, and for some services. That we that we depend upon, like um, like f uh, d let me um, water quantity, water quality, or on um, or uh, not, well, some services is not as clear. It's harder to it's harder. We either don't have models to help us understand how they'll be in, impacted in the future, or we don't have a good way of valuing uh, the service. That that the that the is provided in the future. And, and Go ahead, Steph, you know, for for me, the 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 really interesting thing about carbon sequestration in forests and also the effects on grassland grazing is these are two iconic areas of agricultural and sort of economic development in California and Oregon generally. Um, and these aren't places that people, you know, your mind usually goes to when you start thinking of climate change. So we, we talk to people about, you know, there may be less drinking water. Everybody in California gets that and knows what that means. If we talk about um, less snow for ski resorts, people get that pretty quickly, too. But uh, they don't think about how this is going to affect the cattle industry. How is this going to affect grass-fed beef, which is everything, you know, something that more and more people are demanding. And then how is that going to affect our ability, as Californians say, to reduce our impact on the climate? So here we are, you know, we've, we've got these great bills in California, um, targets for reducing carbon. All the while, uh, we have to be cognizant of the fact that the forest is our biggest asset for keeping carbon out of the atmosphere. And the forest itself is likely to change dramatically because of climate. And then you overlay that um, with just what's happened over the last 70 years in terms of urban development. And we've really constrained the ability of nature to react to climate. Climate's always been changing. Um, it's changing more rapidly now, and it may change even more rapidly in the next 50 to 70 years. But one of the things that's changed is we've hemmed in these grasslands, and we've hemmed in our forests with highways and cities. And that's going to make a big impact on our ability to deal with these changes. Because of the fact that there is simply a limit to uh, the, the land that's dedicated to these ecosystem services? We, that's right. So if it turns out that the way climate changing is going to mean the San Francisco metropolitan area now has better precipitation uh, that would favor grasslands, well, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> because you have cities all over it. Exactly.
Got it. We were, uh, we're talking to Linwood Pendleton and Rebecca Shaw about their report, The Impact of Climate Change on California Ecosystem Services. You can join us on the exchange at 800-838-3760, toll free anywhere you're listening to us. In the Rogue Valley, our local number is 541-552-6782. Our email address, jx at jeffnet.org. Our first email came in yesterday afternoon, actually, when we first posted the information about today's interview on our Facebook page. And Isaac, no town given simply says liberal socialist and keynesian policies in addition to legal plunder through confiscatory regulatory policies is what is killing california and other liberal bastions not the climate rebecca do you want to take a crack at that one i don't i don't know that i'm uh i have sufficient expertise to uh to respond to that i might i might ask if linwood does okay <laughs> well i would just say you know in addition to whatever else you think is causing trouble, uh, changing climate is clearly something that w we have to deal with. And so there, there are two sides to the climate coin. Is One is, is what should we do um, to change the trajectory of climate? And the other is what are we going to do about climate now that it is changing? And it always has been changing. So uh, there are always going to be other factors, economic factors, globalization, politics, urbanization. But the fact of the matter is, is that precipitation patterns are changing, um, temperature patterns are changing, and we have to understand those changes in order to plan for this. So it's interesting at NOAA, one of the um, sectors that demands our climate data the most ends up being agriculture, especially long-term agriculture like tree crops. You, know, you can't pull up your tree and plant a different tree every year to, to adapt for uh, changing precipitation patterns. You, you need to know what the, the climate's going to look like 20 or 30 years. So if we're managing forests and we start managing forests for carbon, or we're managing grasslands and we manage them for cattle, we better start putting together uh, a good body of knowledge about how these things are likely to change so we can do a good job of managing those. Which raises the question, then, how far into the future did you cast the assumptions? I mean, we were talking 30 years, 50 years, something longer than that? We broke it up into 30-year um, periods, and we took it out to 2,100 with the recognition that uh, we weren't trying to say, this is what the world is going to be in 2070 or 2100, um, but this is what it might look like if these things happen. And so these things being, here's what it would look like, well, here's what we think it'll look like if climate change continues the pace without any increases in CO2 over what we have now. And here's what we think it might look like if we substantially increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And what we've done is, we, we, like I said before, we, we focused on a couple of key elements, nutrients, um, direct carbon fertilization in the air, precipitation, and fire. But, you know, anyone who has had a garden knows that there are a gazillion factors. And these models are really trying to hit on the, the most important factors initially that describe a lot of what happens in um, determining what kind of land cover we have. And what? just sort of play this through. When we were talking about the climate models earlier, did you end up making assumptions uh, based on several different climate models? In other words, do you have one that says, okay, this is going to be the effect if it's this much warmer and wetter. This is going to be the effect if it's this much warmer and drier, for example. Did you have multiple outcomes? We definitely did. We, we, because we don't know what climate change, exactly what climate change is going to look like in the future in California, we want to better bracket what we think it might look like in the future, given the kinds of changes that are happening in the atmosphere. And so we, we, we looked at a model that would have output that was gave us a warmer, wetter California and one that gave a hotter, drier. I think one thing we know for certain is that temperatures temperature will increase in the future. We'll have hotter summers. We'll have uh, warmer winters. The thing that is not as clear um, and that the, it's more difficult to predict into the future is what the rain, what the precipitation, the rain and the snow will do. We're pretty sure that that, that will have decreasing snowfall, which will be uh, replaced by increasing rainfall. So the rain precipitation will fall as rain instead of snow in the future, which has implications for 
the timing of runoff and snowmelt and implications for um, the ecosystems we're talking about. So we wanted to capture and bracket the future uh, for a wet future and one for a dry future. Okay. Yeah. Let's take some more calls here. We have Brad and Ashland on the line. Welcome to the Jefferson Exchange. We're talking about the impact of climate change and California ecosystem services with Rebecca Shaw and Linwood Pendleton. Hi, Brad. Yes, thank you. It's such an important topic, and, and there's a lot of uh, things to be concerned about, despite that person's uh, dismissive uh, screed about <laughs> uh, Kinsey and stuff. The, the economic uh, forecast would be extraordinarily, it would be catastrophically different if we were to follow a pattern that uh, if we look farther back into geological history, the norm on Earth is an ice age of 100 to 150,000 years duration. In between the ice ages are these short periods, 10, 15,000 years of warm weather. We've been in a warm period for that time. And when we look at uh, the older ice age periods and the temperatures that preceded them, there was a spike in temperature, which seems to come just before the Ice Age onslaught, almost like a trigger for an Ice Age, and there are reasons why that might be the case. I'm wondering whether they have factored that uh, enormous uh, possibility in and what they might uh, say about that. All right. Thanks for the call, Brad. Appreciate it. Linwood, what did you include there? Well, we certainly didn't include a a future Ice Age. (laughs) Um, What we did is we looked at, I think, our relatively modest changes in uh, precipitation and fire regimes. So we we tried to be relatively conservative. And I think what we show is you don't need uh, major catastrophes. You you don't need the kind of um, far-blown hyperbole uh, that we often hear about climate change to get substantial economic impacts. And, And that's because our economy has grown up around the natural world that we have today and we've seen for the last 50 to 100 years, by and large. And our ability to shift that economy has really changed. Um, There's a lot of inertia. You can't pick up and move cities. You can't pick up and uh, move the cattle industry the way you could have uh, 150 years ago. So what we're seeing in these models is that even relatively modest changes and and climate have a big impact on the way people use and benefit from the environment because we've just become used to this environment and we've developed our economies around what we have now. We have an email here from uh, Stan in Ashland. He writes, when the Great Recession began, the very people who helped create the economic mess were put into power to undo it, clearly unrealistic. Similarly, it's market thinking that has helped create the environmental mess. Does it really make sense to rely on market-based solutions? He puts market-based solutions in quotes to undo it. Rebecca Shaw, what what would you say about that? I I think that is a really good question. And uh, but I I do think that there is a it, it's what we're looking at as market-based solutions as incentives to um, to develop. Um, you know, to develop incentives to allow um, landowners, uh, ranchers, foresters to um, to better manage their land for the benefits that we have come to rely upon and that our economy is relies upon. I think that there's for a long time we have gotten these benefits or these services for free from nature, and we haven't considered. Uh, the long-term cost of providing these services. Um, and climate change really uh, helps us focus and, and address that. I think that if you can provide the incentives for, for landowners to change man, land management practices to really address this, I think that's, that will provide some of the benefits we want in the future, and certainly. So carrots instead of sticks, in other words. Let's, let's come back to that, that thought. We have uh, Rebecca Shaw and Linwood Pendleton on the line talking about climate change. Back in the exchange in one minute. Final segment on today's Jefferson Exchange. I'm Jeffrey Riley. Thank you for listening. Our guests today are M. Rebecca Shaw and Lidwood Pendleton, co-authors of a report called The Impact of Climate Change on California Ecosystem Services. You can join us on the exchange at 800-838-3760, toll-free anywhere in the region. In the Rogue Valley, 
1-800-826-6782. Rebecca Shaw at the Environmental Defense Fund is also a working group member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. Uh, so, Rebecca, this idea about the market-based solutions to, to issues raised by climate change, is the point that people are more likely to participate in market-based solutions because they can actually get some sort of profit or, or at least financial benefit out of it rather than imposing something that they feel ill ill used to uh, to want to take part in that that's right i i think it's i i think it's really there are there are it's it's just realigning incentives to uh get the outcomes that we want when, once you start um quantifying the economic benefits that nature provides then you really have the opportunity to develop the incentives uh, through market-based solutions to make sure that you can continue those benefits into the future. I think what this study really does is helps illustrate how many things we take for granted that we receive from from uh, natural lands and managed lands, uh, range lands and agricultural lands, and how climate change will impact those and what the economic impact will be, and therefore what the opportunities will be to provide incentives to um, make them more resilient in, fu- in the future and ensure that we can um, receive those benefits long into the future. So in the two major areas you looked at, which is uh, carbon, sequestra- carbon sequestration in forests and forage production on rangelands, did you come up with dollar figures on forage production? Did you Were you able to say, okay, if, if, if we can't graze cattle because it's just gotten so hot that these things don't grow or there's less of it, did you come up with a dollar figure to say what the actual impact on the economy would be? We did. And what'd you get? And, and, and what we did, we, we did two different things here. One is um, we know how much dry forage the average cow eats, and it's, believe it or not, almost 10,000 pounds of dry forage a year. Hmm. Uh, and, and we know that on net, uh, after you've fed the cows and, and done whatever it does, to, whatever cows need to have to raise them to the age where you can take them to the slaughterhouse, you'll earn about $110 per cow. So what we did is we looked at these models and said, okay, um, let's look and see how land cover is going to change. And uh, where we still have grasslands, do we know anything about the productivity of forage on these grasslands under different kinds of uh, rainfall patterns? And so we we calculated how much forage was likely to change on the places that would still be grasslands and then converted that into uh, a number, you know, how many cow pounds uh, would be produced by that area and then calculated the impacts of climate on forage on cow production. And so that's sort of a, a profit change under different climate scenarios. And, you know, that looks at looks, looks like around $20 million per year um, under the sort of least impactful scenario. And it goes up to $40, 50000000 million a year which, uh, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot of money unless that's coming out of your pocket as a, a cattle rancher. On the other hand, um, the other thing we did is said, okay, well, look, some people aren't going to be able to move their cattle, uh, and they're just going to have to buy feed. And so we said, let's, let's start with the cheapest feed that's most like forage, which is hay. And so how much does hay cost? Uh, how much hay would you have to feed these cows if you didn't have that much forage? And what would that cost? That's sort of business as usual but now you're feeding the cattle hay. And that is much more expensive. That's more like $312 million a year um, under the most severe climate change scenarios. Well, but then you're also assuming that, uh, that there'll be no particular interruptions in the ability to grow hay, aren't you? Yes, that's right. That hay is still there. Okay. Let's uh, take another call. Here's Pam and Dexter. Welcome to the Jefferson Exchange. We're talking about climate change and the impact on California ecosystem services with Linwood Pendleton and Rebecca Shaw. Hi, thanks for having such a great topic. Um, You know, there's a really good book that came out a few years ago um, called Natural Capitalism by Amory Lovins and Paul Hawkins that talks about including the cost of nature and how we price everything, Um, you know, the ecosystem services and all that. And then I was reminded just now of um, uh, what it takes uh, to produce a pound of beef. I think it's like 200-plus gallons of water, and I forgot how many pounds of grain and grass, like, you know, and so the the alternative of just eating the grains and grass and drinking the water would would feed a lot more people. So I think 
going towards more of a plant-based diet rather than meat-based would be also a good thing. But I was um, I was hiking in Mount June, which is near our house, at about 3,000 feet in December, and the huckleberry bushes had buds on them in December. And so I wonder um, how much of your calculations have you thought about the disrupt, disruptive seasonal stuff, like, you know, the bird's you know, come in at a certain time, but all the plants that they normally eat aren't available because they've already seeded out a month earlier, et cetera. Because um, that's, that's pretty big to figure out how, you know, with all the disruptions, there's going to be uh, an imbalance of food supply, and it's going to kind of mess everything up, <laughs> basically. And, that you know, we, we look to our politicians, but they're all on the short-term thinking because all they're really thinking about is, well, is this going to be popular for the next election if I ask people to conserve gas, drive slower, eat less, da-da-da? I mean, people don't want to make these sacrifices, and I, I, I'm waiting for some politician to have the courage to speak truth about our situation, and I just see the system is set up for them to be more worried about getting the campaign donations from the large industries that don't want us to face climate change. And anyways, that's a lot to talk about, and I'll listen on the radio. Thanks All right, for thanks the show. for calling, Pam. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. So, Lynn, when you do look, did look at a whole bunch of, of models, did you? I mean, in fact, there is a particular mention in the uh, in the carbon sequestration part of this about uh, different trees growing in different areas. Um, quite a few maps in there that make this quite abundantly clear. So, we're, Pam's example, the huckleberries budding in December, is not an isolated one, but and it's it's referenced not directly to the huckleberries, but in this report, yes. Well, we don't look, for instance, at how um, animal life is going to change and then what's the cyclical effect of that then again on on vegetation. Uh, we tried to focus on some of the core elements about land cover, but, uh, you know, she's exactly right. This, what we're doing here is just showing this is what we know about some basic factors that drive these systems, but in fact these are very complicated systems, and there are all these cascades of effects. But, you know, there's another really important point um, that I think she made, too, which was really the interconnectedness of all of us with these ecosystems. And one of the things that we've tried to do with these models is just demonstrate to people in California that climate change is not uh, a remote problem that only affects people near the equator. And your actions in the city, whether you drive a car or use lots of power, are going to affect people in California in ways that you probably haven't thought about. So Rebecca's talked a lot about market-based solutions, but there are many, many solutions. And I think the first step, whether it's creating a market or creating better politics, is to just make everybody more aware of how their impacts in the environment affect other people and other people that you care about. So we, we say all the time we care about cattle ranchers, we care about that way of life, we care about the forests, we care about the Sierras, uh, we, we care about having access to nature. We care about tourism. Well, what we're trying to do with these models is just demonstrate how we need to start thinking about who might be affected by climate so we can start putting these people together to make the right decisions, not just putting it off. We talked about the, uh, the dollar value then of the, uh, of the potential shifting in, uh, in forage on uh, wildlands in California. What then was the basic finding of, of uh, carbon sequestration in forests? Well, so with, with cattle grazing on these grasslands, there's an unambiguous cost. So whether we have a, a warmer, wetter, or a hotter, drier um, climate, grasslands are going to shrink. And that's partly because of the fact that we've hemmed them in. And partly because, you know, we have so many cattle in California in that sort of central part of California. And that is an area that's going to change under either climate scenario. When it comes to carbon sequestration, we, we find that under the warmer, wetter scenario, uh, our forests and land cover actually do a better job of sequestering carbon. So there could be a benefit there. Um, and uh, under the hotter, drier, we lose a lot of carbon storage ability. So what we're looking at is under warmer, wetter, uh, we see an improved ability to store carbon of around $22 billion. But under a hotter, drier, we are losing about $62 billion um, in carbon storage. And when I say $62 billion, what I'm talking about is what we did is we, we used estimates of the impacts that one ton of carbon in the atmosphere has globally. 
So it affects agriculture around the world. It affects uh, air conditioning and power supplies. It affects flooding. There have been a number of studies that have tried to look at these impacts. And we used a, a variety of scenarios for those impacts to kind of think about if we emit a, another ton of carbon from California and it goes up into the atmosphere, what is its economic impact on the world economy? All right, we have a couple more calls in here. Let's talk to Ed in Shasta County. Welcome to the Jefferson Exchange. We're talking about climate change and California ecosystems with Linwood Pendleton and Rebecca Shaw. Yes, I'd like to ask you in terms of you talked about cascade, cascading changes in ecosystems, both the economic and carbon sequestration effects of the very different uh, forest management that's occurred in Northern California in the last 20 years, uh, conversion of large mixed forests to uh, uh, conifer monocultures with uh, even age management, clear cutting, and how that is going to affect it. It would seem likely that the lack of integrity, biological integrity of, of tree farms as opposed to forest throws a huge uncertainty into your projections in terms of uh, uh, both cases, both the economic and carbon sequestration impacts. So did you, so the, I guess the question for Linwood then is, did you include the, uh, the change in management practices in your models? Present and future, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think Re Rebecca can answer that from the scientific perspective. But w what I'll mention is that what you're really talking about is the resilience and adaptability of forests uh, to, to endure climate change. And so that clearly is, is something that's going to be important. And is if you make forests less resistant and less adaptable, you're almost certainly going to reduce their ability to store carbon. All right, Ed, thanks for the call. Uh, Rebecca, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I just want to I, – I think it's a really important point. Um, that Ed makes because it, it speaks to how you you don't have to be we don't have to be victims to these changes in the future. The purpose of the study is really to understand what possible outcomes are in the future and begin to manage our systems uh, so that we can they can continue to provide the benefits that we rely on, including the timber production. And so Ed points out that one of those ways, one of those th places we might want to look is the whether we're, we're uh, growing forests that are large mixed forests or whether they're monocultures and whether that will have an impact on the amount of carbon that will be sequestered and the timber that will be produced in the future. It's a great question to ask, and it's the kind of question we'd like to inspire by this kind of study. And, and let's add carbon to the land of many uses. Right, right. One more thing to, that the, the, the forests are good for. Let's talk to uh, Christopher in McKinleyville. Welcome to the Jefferson Exchange with, with Linwood Pendleton and Rebecca Shaw. Good morning, folks. Um, I was wondering, the purpose of the report seems to be basically using market-based solutions to sustain an unsustainable system. Most of the, most of the population of California lives in a desert and it has been sucking the rest of the resources of California to sustain that population. Uh, does your report think about the fact that that might not be able to be sustained and the largest population we have is going to have to exit that area? Well, that's a good question, Christopher. Thanks for that. And, Lynn, would you address that a bit, it seems like, when you talked about, for example, if, uh, if we get more rain that makes great grasslands in places where they're already cities, it's not much you can do about that. So you're not talking about mass you know, mass changes in societal yeah. structures here, are you? That, that's right. And so uh, uh, two things. One is the first is I don't think this report um, really is about market-based solutions. It's about the climate and the impact of climate on these ecosystem services. And then market-based solutions is one of many ways of trying to do something about what we've discovered. Um, but the fact uh, of the matter is, is that people do live in these places, and these places may in fact become less hospitable, and it's probably not the case that we're going to be able to shut down entire cities and pick them up and move. Um, so what we've done is we've taken where people are now as the baseline and uh, assumed that cities aren't going to move and make dramatic changes, um, but they could make changes in their trajectory. And, and we've tried to look at urbanization and the, the cover of populations, human populations, as an overlay to our models of land cover in California. Rebecca Shaw, we just have a few seconds left. Um, I'm, this has been out long enough to be getting some reactions in addition to what you're getting here today. What's What's been the general tone of what you've heard back? Uh, the general tone has been positive, um, not, not because we're, we're providing answers to the future, but we're providing 
uh, questions about the way we might think about the future and how we might be um, making choices to sustain the things we value and the, the, the things that our economy depends upon. Well, it is certainly a thought-provoking report, the impact of climate change on California ecosystem services. Rebecca Shaw from the Environmental Defense Fund and the Interna- Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, thanks for joining us today. Thank Linwood, you very much. Linwood Pendleton, Director of Ocean and Coastal Policy at Duke University's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy and Acting Chief Economist at NOAA. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Glad to have you both. Tomorrow on the Jefferson Exchange at 8 o'clock, we'll have our Vince Day segment. At 9 o'clock, David Owen from The New Yorker will join us to talk about his book, Conundrum, about how good intentions can make climate change and energy problems worse. That'll be interesting to talk about. That's tomorrow on The Exchange. Our producer is Lisa Polito. Our student assistant, Samantha Grafton. I'm Jeffrey Riley. Thanks for listening. Join us again soon for another edition of the Jefferson Exchange, and have a great day. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.